cue, missed my cue. <laughs> Made it. <laughs> Sorry, I'm just ad-libbing that part of it. I was missing my cue. Hey, good morning. It is good to look out and see all of you. It's good to see all of you joining us online today. What an amazing day. The sun is shining. It is 12 degrees. From here, it looks like a 70 degree day as I look out the windows, and that's what I'm going to go with. Tomorrow's the first day of spring. Hey, we could, we could stay with a little more winter if you want to do that. That's your call. I'm looking, for, I'm looking for spring. Hey, I am so thankful for the goodness of God. You know, as that song we sang, his goodness is running after us. You know, the reality is, is God loves us us so much that he's not just setting up shop saying hey come over here if you want to he really wants to touch your life to bless your life to change your life to set you free to give you hope in a future that's his plan that's his purpose for every single one of us and I'm so thankful so thankful we have a couple of funerals this week I just want to uh, bring to your attention Ferg Taylor passed away this week and his service is tomorrow right here at 11. Visitation today from 2 to 4 at Caldwell, Caldwell Parish, which is over on Hickman. And then on Thursday is a funeral here at 11 a.m. for Georgie Niece. So be praying for those, those families and a lot of sympathies that you'll read in the bulletin. In our series in Genesis, we have been looking the past 10 Sundays at the story of Abraham. Ten chapters ago, Abraham receives a promise. That is 25 years if you're doing the math. He received the promise that God would make him into a great nation. But there is a problem with that promise. And the only problem that I would say is the problem is how we look at things. There is a problem with that promise. We are prone to see the problems. How many of you would be honest and say you're prone to see the problem first? Okay, you look at a situation, it's like, I see everything wrong about it. I see everything that could be a, a problem with that. I just tend to see things that way. There is a problem with this promise, but I'm thankful that God sees things differently than we do. How many of you found that to be true? God has the perspective to see everything. He's got a bird's eye view of everything. We can't see the forest for the trees. But if we fix our eyes on him, the one who sees everything, then we're good to go. The problem here is that Abraham and Sarah were promised a child, and when they received this promise, they were 75 and 65 years old. Not the age that most people start having kids. But they didn't receive a child at 75 and 65. We're going to read today, 25 years later. You do the math, 90 and 100. Seemed like an impossibility from the start. And through a series of misadventures, Abraham has moments of faith, of trusting God, but also big moments of missteps and mistakes. I wonder how many times Abraham and Sarah questioned the promise. God, did we hear you right? Did we do something wrong? Did we mess up too badly? God promised, but it still hasn't happened. Our text this morning is Genesis chapter 21, if you want to turn there. But first, I want to look at chapter 18. So if you get 21, just go back a couple pages. Chapter 18, we're going to go back and pick up a, a little bit of information. In Genesis chapter 18, verse 9, Abraham has an encounter with three visitors. And this is, how, in verse 9, it says, starts with them saying, where is your wife Sarah? Abraham said, there in the tent. And one of them said, I will surely return to you about this time next year, and Sarah, your wife, will have a son. Now Sarah was listening at the entrance of their tent, which was behind him. Abraham and Sarah were already very old, and Sarah was past the age of childbearing. So Sarah laughed to herself as she thought, after I am worn out and my Lord is old, will I now have this pleasure? And the Lord said to Abraham, why did Sarah laugh and say, will I really have a child now that I'm old? Is anything too hard for the Lord? I will return to you at the appointed time next year and Sarah will have a son. Sarah was afraid, so she lied and said, I did not laugh. But he said, yes, you did laugh. 
For years they've been praying, waiting, trusting God. But here they are given a very specific to the promise. This time next year, one year from now, I will return and Sarah will have a child. She will have a son. Sarah laughed at that. And I don't know if you detected in her laugh, this was not a laugh of joy. This was a laugh of skepticism, of sarcasm, and doubt. Abraham does the same thing back in chapter 17. This is where God changes Sarah's name. And he says to Abraham, I will bless her and I will give you a son from her. Yes, I will bless her richly and she will become the mother of many nations. Kings of nations will be among her descendants. Then Abraham bowed to the ground and he laughed to himself in disbelief. How could I become a father at the age of 100? And how could Sarah have a baby when she's 90 years old? I would say that we've all been there where we've had these moments of doubt and disbelief where it seems that things are impossible and we're wondering how in the world could this thing work out. Moments of frustration where we're ready to give up and maybe a similar laugh where it's just this laugh of sarcasm. Oh, sure, yeah, right. Anybody ever been in that camp? But then God speaks and he said, why does Sarah laugh and say, can an old woman like me have a baby? Is anything too hard for the Lord? And I want us to contemplate that question this morning that the Lord asks. Is anything too hard for the Lord? It's really not a question, it's a statement. This is what we call a rhetorical question. But I want us to contemplate this today. Is anything too hard for the Lord and I'm intentionally keeping the message shorter today so that we can have time to respond. And so I just wanna ask you this morning, I don't know what you've come today with on your heart. I don't know what you need in your life, what you're facing today, what you're dealing with, what you're battling against, but I want to apply this question to your circumstances. Is anything too hard for the Lord? Is anything, fill in the blank. Take your circumstances, your situation, and fill it in the blank. Is cancer too hard for the Lord? Is infertility too hard for the Lord? Is addiction, a marriage relationship, your finances, a wayward child, loneliness, depression, is your health too difficult for the Lord? I believe this morning that God wants to build our faith in him that nothing is too hard for him, nothing. That he can heal broken bodies, that he can dry up diseases, that he can bring home the prodigals, he can restore marriages, he can heal families, and he can break addictions. And so at the end of the message this morning, I'm gonna invite you to come forward and we're gonna pray and believe. How many of you would like to walk out of this room today knowing that God is in your camp and that he's working things for good and that he can meet you right here today and in a moment change everything? I'm gonna share some testimonies with you this morning of things that have happened with people that are part of our church. And some of these testimonies, these miracles happened in a moment, but I'm gonna tell you, it wasn't just in that moment. They had been battling, working through, struggling through years of something, and then God just met them and changed everything. God is a good God and he does good things. And I want you to know this morning that you can believe for miracles from God because nothing Nothing is too hard for him. So the Lord says, I'll return this time next year and Sarah will have a son, and she laughs. But what we're gonna see is that God gets the last laugh. Chapter 21, we finally get there. Chapter 21, the first seven verses. All of these 10 previous chapters, these 25 years of anticipation, and it leads to these few verses right here. And it says this, now the Lord was gracious to Sarah, as he had said, and the Lord did for Sarah what he had promised. Sarah became pregnant and bore a son to Abraham in his old age at that very time that God had promised him. Abraham gave him the name Isaac to the son that Sarah bore him. And when his son Isaac was eight days old, Abraham circumcised him as God had commanded him. Abraham was 100 years old when Isaac was born to him. Sarah said, God has brought me laughter and everyone who hears about this will laugh with me. And she added, who would have said to Abraham and Sarah that Sarah would nurse children, yet I have borne him a son in his old age. Finally, 
Finally, finally the fulfillment of the promise. It's time to celebrate because Isaac, the promised son, has arrived. Listen, a 90-year-old woman gave birth to a baby. Woo! (laughs) Is that not exciting to you? Is anything too hard for the Lord? You don't sound convinced. Is anything too hard for the Lord? A 90-year-old woman giving birth to a child. Who would have ever thought? Abraham and Sarah couldn't even have thought. And they were, they were given the promise, and they embraced this promise. Although they struggled through the 25 years of this promise, But God is faithful to his promise is the first point of my message this morning. God is faithful to his promise. He gives them this promise. And through their doubt and their disobedience, God is faithful to fulfill his promises. You know that it's estimated that there are 30,000 promises in Scripture. 30,000. And 2 Corinthians 1.20 says that all of God's promises are yes in Christ. All of them are yes and amen. Numbers 23, 19 says, God is not a man, so he does not lie. He is not human, so he does not change his mind. Has he ever spoken and failed to act? That's a rhetorical question. Has he ever promised and not carried it through? Again, rhetorical question that demands the answer, no, he is always fulfilling his promises. Every promise that God has ever made will be fulfilled. Ephesians 1.11 says he makes everything work out according to his plan. Psalm 145.13 says the Lord always keeps his promise. How many of you have a promise from the Lord? How many of you have received a promise from the Lord and seen it fulfilled? Some of you may have promises that you're holding on to. Maybe it's a wayward child and you're saying, I'm holding on to this promise and it de- definitely gets very hard at times. Believing in faith that they're gonna, they're gonna be saved and their life's gonna be turned around. I don't know what it is that you are praying for or believing God for, but I wanna tell you and remind you this morning that God is a promise keeper. He keeps his promise. If he said it, you can believe it. He's a man of his word. He never goes back on his word. He will always fulfill his promise. You can trust him 100%. Abraham, like us, can only see a certain amount. Just the here and now. And what, what he can see here and now isn't very clearly. I identify with that. But God had a plan and a purpose for what he was doing with Abraham and Sarah. It was part of a bigger story. And as we read through scripture, we'll get to the New Testament and we're gonna see in a couple of weeks at Easter, the fulfillment of the promise is Jesus. And guess where Jesus comes through? The family line of Abraham. This was all part of a bigger story. And we've gotta trust and believe that God is telling a story and we're part of that and what we see is just a little glimpse. But we need to fix our eyes on him. His, His word is filled with promises. And those are for all of us. Romans chapter 4 is a New Testament summary of this Old Testament story of Abraham. And I want to just share a few verses. Romans chapter 4 verse 18 says this. Against all hope, Abraham in hope believed. And so became the father of many nations, just as it had been said to him, so shall your offspring be. Without weakening in his faith, he faced the fact that his body was as good as dead, since he was about 100 years old and Sarah's womb was also dead. Yet he did not waver through unbelief regarding the promise of God, but was strengthened in his faith and gave glory to God, being fully persuaded that God had the power to do what he had promised. Being fully persuaded that God had the power to do what he promised. Is your faith in God such that you are fully persuaded that God can do anything? Is there anything that he cannot do? Do you believe that this morning? I want to have faith like Abraham, that against all hope, even when there was no reason for hope, Abraham kept hoping he had faith and without weakening in his faith he faced the facts what were the facts what are the facts of your situation what are the facts of your circumstances face the facts 
The facts are the facts. That's it. You can't change it. They couldn't change the fact that they were already well past childbearing years when God even gave them this promise. And yet 25 years until they received the promise, it was absolutely undeniable the hand of God. Face the facts. Abraham's facts were that his body was as good as dead, that he was way too old to have children. But that doesn't matter. It doesn't matter. The facts don't matter. Why? Do you know the answer why? He was fully persuaded that God was able to do what he said he would do. Fully persuaded. God is faithful to his promises. God is faithful to his promises and he is powerful. There is nothing too hard for him. God transformed Sarah's womb from a womb that was dead, that was way beyond childbearing years, to be able to produce a child. He transforms her laugh. She laughs sarcastically and says, oh, oh, yeah, right. A woman my age is going to give birth to a child. Do you remember what she said in chapter 6 of 21? God has brought me laughter, and everyone who hears about this will laugh with me. Now, that's a different kind of laugh. That's a laugh filled with joy, filled with hope, filled with promise. And she said, everybody who hears this story is going to laugh with me. What does the name Isaac mean? He laughs. God transforms even her laugh. He is almighty. He is all powerful. There is nothing that our God can't do. Isaiah chapter 40. God says this, to whom will you compare me? Who is my equal? Ask the Holy One. Look up into the heavens. Who created all the stars? He brings them out like an army, one after another, calling each by its name. Because of his great power and incomparable strength, not a single one is missing. Oh, Jacob, how can you say that the Lord does not see your troubles? Oh, Israel, how can you say God ignores your rights? Have you not heard? Have you not understood? The Lord is the everlasting God, the creator of all the earth. He never grows weak or weary. No one can measure the depths of his understanding. He gives power to the weak and strength to the powerless. Even youths will become weak and tired and young men will fall in exhaustion. But those who trust in the Lord will find new strength. Those who wait on the Lord, some of your versions say, will find new strength. They will soar on wings like eagles. They will run and not grow weary. They will walk and they will not faint. Praise God. Our God who created the heavens is intimately involved in our lives and there is nothing, absolutely nothing that is too difficult for him. So let that build faith in your circumstances, in your situation, in your hurt, in your pain, in your situation that seems hopeless. That the facts tell you this could never happen. This will never work out. It's an impossibility except for the fact that you know a God, you serve a God, you've surrendered to a God who is all about the impossible. Nothing is impossible for him. So thankful. Jeremiah 32, 17, O sovereign Lord, you made the heavens and the earth by your strong hand and your powerful arm. Nothing is too hard for you. Over and over and over we hear this truth that nothing is too hard for God. It's the same response that the angel Gabriel gave to Mary when the angel came to Mary and said, you've you've been chosen to carry the Messiah. And her question was a good question. It's facing the facts. And she said, how can this be when I've never been with a man? I'm a virgin. That's a good question. That's the facts. How am I going to become pregnant if I've never been with a man? And he said, well, the Holy Spirit's going to come on you. The power of the Most High will overshadow you. And he even goes on to say, your cousin Elizabeth, in her old age, with her womb that's past the years of childbearing, is already six months pregnant. The one who they called infertile is now in her sixth month. And what does he say in that statement? For nothing is impossible with God. Nothing. 
When you think about this truth, it should raise the level of excitement in your life. I don't know if you're excited today. You're doing a good job of hiding it. (laughs) This should raise the level of excitement and expectation in our lives. How could it not raise that? You have the privilege of knowing and serving a God who literally can do anything. There's nothing that's impossible for him. And that is an absolutely incredible fact if we're talking about the facts. The lyrics to the song Waymaker. He, he's a way maker. Even And when I don't see it, he's working. When I can't feel it, he's working. He never stops working things together for good in our life. That's a promise that we have. Romans 8, 28. We know that in all things, God works for the good of those who love him and are called according to to his purpose. God is faithful to his promises and he's all powerful. I hope you believe this this morning. I told you I was gonna share some stories and I wanna do that. Just about a year and a half ago, we were praying for Pastor August and Carissa for six, over six years of their married life been wanting, hoping, desiring a child and uh, realizing that uh, there were more questions than answers and they needed a miracle from God. They went to see a specialist, a fertility specialist. The tests came back normal and the diagnosis was unexplained infertility. No answers. But after six years of waiting, they found out in the fall of 2021 that they were pregnant. There were a lot of challenging moments through their pregnancy, but there is little Adelaide Joy who is now nine and a half months old. Praise the Lord. We've been praying for a long time for Samuel Reynolds. This is James and Abby Ann's uh, youngest son who's a year and a half old. He's had multiple brain surgeries in his year and a half. This Monday, he had an appointment with a doctor, an eye appointment. And the doctor said it was the first time that he's ever reacted to light. Praise the Lord. Physical therapist said he's putting objects in front and following with his eyes. That is a miracle from God, and I'm so thankful and appreciative. Some of you know Bernie Harmeyer. Bernie uh, has, has attended New Hope for uh, maybe about three years, he and his family. Bernie's been a type 2 diabetic for 15 years, and he's dealt with neuropathy for 10 years. To treat those conditions, he has taken two shots of insulin a day, been on metformin twice a day, and is on 3,000 milligrams a day of gabapentin for the neuropathy and and pain in his legs. About a month ago, he started noticing his blood sugars getting lower and lower. So he called his doctor, got an appointment with the doctor, but in order to bring his blood sugars back up, he went off of his insulin. So he went to the doctor, and the doctor did all the blood work and came back and said, Bernie, I don't know what the problem is. All your blood work looks normal. He said, that's great, doc, but I haven't been on insulin for three days. I haven't taken any of my meds for three days. And now a month later, he has not had any insulin, any metformin. He's off all of his, all of his uh, gabapentin, and he has, his blood sugars are fine, his A1C is fine, his kidneys, his liver, his pancreas, they've tested all of that, and everything's good. Praise the Lord. Rachel Nicholish, Rachel and Nick have attended New Hope for a few years and Rachel wrote out her testimony and I'm just gonna read that for you this morning. She says, in a nutshell, I was born into an alcoholic, drug addicted, dysfunctional family. I heard the gospel when I was four years old on a Christian radio station and tears started streaming down my face as I asked Jesus into my heart. I became addicted to meth shortly after my 14th birthday, and for almost 18 years, it owned me. But never once did God abandon me. I could always feel his presence trying to pull me out of the dark. He revealed himself to me in ways that I could not deny. The very first time I went to church at New Hope, Pastor Zach was preaching on Jonah. I knew this message was specifically for me. I knew that God had a high calling on my life and I did everything I could to run as fast and as far in the opposite direction that I could. Jonah had it easy. Three days in the belly of a whale would have been a cakewalk for me. Nevertheless, I kept coming back. I started declaring God's promises out loud over my life and with the help of my husband, I checked myself into an inpatient treatment program. I hit my knees and I surrendered my life 
completely to God. That was April 14, 2020. I've had a couple of minor slips since then, but from using every day of my life for almost 18 years to using twice in the past three years is an amazing victory for my life. Amen. She said, Jesus is not only my savior today, he is the Lord of my life. Jesus died on the cross for my sins, and now I die to him daily. The scripture that is the cry of my heart is Paul saying, it's no longer I who live, but Christ who lives in me. It brings me to tears every single time, and that's what I want most. Praise God for a transformed life. The next story I want to tell you is of Brenda McClure. Brenda and Aaron have been coming to New Hope since October. And I just want to give a disclaimer to this story. She wrote out this, this testimony. It was three pages worth of text. And she's listening online right now. And I, I, I edited it down just for our sake today. But there's a bigger story to tell. And the big part of their story is a faith story. Because just in the last five or six years, their whole family has been saved out of Mormonism. That's what they grew up in. That's all they knew until about five or six years ago. And Brenda starts out saying, I love the question that the Lord asked of Abraham. Is anything too hard for the Lord? When I was just a young teen, I started having medical issues but never got answers. My health just continued to get worse. Shortly after moving to Iowa about 20 years ago, I was, I was diagnosed with primary progressive multiple sclerosis. At that time, I was a young mother of twin infant boys, and my oldest had just started kindergarten. This diagnosis is extremely life-altering, but the MS was actually a secondary diagnosis to my main issue. After more than 30 years from my first symptoms, listen, listen to the timeline here. After 30 years from my first symptoms, we went to the specialist in Iowa City on April 22nd, 2021, and we were given the most incredible and unexplainable news. All of the lesions and markers in my spine had been healed, and all of the lesions in my brain were totally healed except for one which they said they could tell was somehow on the men's. I would no longer ever need to see an MS specialist because God had completely and totally healed me of MS. Praise God. She goes on to say, but as exciting as that moment was, the doctor continued to tell me that I had an extremely rare disease called Paroxysmal non-kinesogenic dyskinesia, PNKD. Fewer than 5,000 people in the U.S. have this rare neurological disorder. Basically, it would cause my muscles to become abnormally stiff or tight. Like if you got a charley horse or would flex your muscles, my muscles would be like that for hours and hours every day. My muscles caused so much exaggerated turning and twisting of my body that scans showed my muscles had begun to twist my spine from all the constant pressure. I became wheelchair bound, had to wear braces on my legs, and take a lot of meds that never really touched the pain. Every night for several months, the muscles between my ribs would cause excruciating pain. The muscles within my respiratory system would tighten up so I couldn't breathe. And my husband would try everything he medically knew to get me to breathe. Her husband is a doctor, crying out to God to calm my muscles. Finally, this past October, I went to a women's conference at James River Church. My son attends James River College, and he wanted me to go to the conference because he knew that God was going to heal me there. The conference was great, and although I was prayed for several times, I never received my healing. But then on Sunday... After the worship had started, the pastor came up, stopped the music, and said, I have a very strong impression that there's someone here who drove a long way from out of town who is wanting and needing prayer for specific healing. If that's you, will you please raise your hand? She said, I shot my arm like I, up like I had won the lottery. He asked if I could step out into the aisle for people to come around me and pray for me, and I hadn't been able to stand, not to mention step out into the aisle, but there were so, so many people who surrounded me to pray. And after prayer, he asked if anyone had been healed, please raise your hand. Again, I shot my hand up, claiming my healing in Jesus' name, because this time I knew that God had done the impossible within my body. This was the first worship service I had been able to stand for the duration of worship. Afterwards, I walked up the ramp for the first time in years, not needing or using any walking device. I sat in my wheelchair to be taken out to the car, but that would be the last time that I ever needed to use a walker or wheelchair again. Praise the Lord.
I am so thankful for God and what he can do. We should never ever feel that we're in a desperate place or a situation that God cannot touch, God cannot move, God cannot heal, God cannot deliver. God can do anything. I'm gonna ask the worship team to come, but I wanna ask you this morning to respond. How many of you this morning, you came with situation, you came with circumstances in your life, and this morning, listen, I believe that God is meeting us here. God is building our faith. God is showing us that he can do anything. And you would say today, Pastor Jeff, I want, I need, I have to have God in this particular situation in my life. I don't care what it is. Maybe it is cancer. Maybe it is some healing of some situation in your life that seems impossible. Maybe it is a wayward child. Maybe it is finances. Maybe it is some wisdom or direction for whatever it is in your life. You need God's help. This morning, he's here to meet you. There's an opportunity here for the circumstances to change forever. How many of you would love to receive from the Lord a healing? How many of you would love to receive from the Lord a breakthrough in your life, a breakthrough in your family, a breakthrough in your marriage, a wayward child to come home? If that's you this morning, would you just stand right where you're at saying, I, I'm all in. I need God in my life. I need God in my situation. I'm asking the question, which isn't really a question, it's a statement. Is anything too hard for, for the Lord? The answer to that is no. God is here to meet us today. I don't know what he's going to do. But I'm so filled with hope and so filled with faith that there's going to be people walk out of this room today just like Brenda. I want to remind you, she'd been prayed for many, many, many times in this short life of faith. But God, in that moment, at James River Church in Ozark, Missouri, had people come around her, and at that moment, God touched, and she's changed forever. Listen, I only know her like this, but her first visit to New Hope in October of of last year, her husband had to carry her in. Pastor Brian went and got a wheelchair for her to come into the service that October, and then she went to this conference. She couldn't walk. Every time I see her, she's got heels on, and you wouldn't know anything's been different. Praise God. This is what he can do. This morning I want you to come. And I want to, we're going to sing. We're going to worship for a little bit. I've talked longer than I wanted to. But we're going to give room for God to do what only he can do. Amen. If you would come this morning and and if you, if you were, maybe you're standing in for somebody else. That person isn't here. And you're just saying, I'm just going to come and stand for for that family member, for that friend. And believe God for for him to move in that situation. Or if you feel so led to come and pray. Listen, there's a lot of us this morning. So I want to ask that you would just come and fill in the space here. And there may be someone pray for you. There may not be someone pray for you. But we're going to believe that God is going to meet us right here. Would you come as we sing this song right now? God.